that you could join us tonight and that you're able to celebrate with us and enjoy with us, not just some of the works of O. Henry, but just a moment of seeing young people using their skills and abilities to glorify the Lord. We have talked a lot during practices and at the end where it's not about us. In fact, David says, not unto us, but unto your name be glorified the glory. And we hope tonight that as you watch, you enjoy our performance. We hope that your heart and spirit is lifted. We hope that you giggle and that you feel free to laugh out loud because some of them are funny and that you have just an evening of relaxing joy. Let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer and we will turn it over to the cast of An Evening with O. Henry. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that the students have had to work, Lord, for the opportunity that they've had to experience the different elements of a performance. And then, Lord, tonight as we put it all together, we ask that your name will be above all praised and glorified. It's not us, Lord, it's not our hard work, but it's your name that we are putting forward and it's your joy that we hope to spread this evening. Lord, I ask that you'll help the cast and the as they serve as both cast and crew, that you will calm nerves. Lord, that you will help them remember the various things that we've talked about with volume and expression. And Lord, that they will have fun tonight and that their joy will spill over into the audience and that we will leave here with our hearts lighter as we've enjoyed time with the beautiful things that you've allowed humans to create. Lord, thank you so much for your love and allowing us to enjoy it and to share it and to share in your joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I have a lot of my stories about New York and I have, I've written some about Philadelphia and others in other large cities. But tonight we're gonna to start out with a little something about travel. Now, the automobile just came out, so I want to go back to a little bit more of my time, to around the train. So, let me find a good one. Oh, this one's a real gem. As you may know, I am most recognized for my little twists. The subtle little occurrences in a story that change everything. However, I like to just slip them in, you know, unobtrusively. <laughs> That's exactly what I do with hearts and hands. If you look very closely, you may notice the twist right off. Mr. Easton knows his business. Will I see you again in Lovensworth? 
I'm afraid not, Miss Fairchild. I have some commitments that will keep me here in the West for quite a while. I love the West. Mom and I spent a summer here in Denver. She went home a week ago because Father was ill, but I stayed on a while. I think that I could live happy here, and I think the Western air agrees with me. I'm sorry, Miss Fairchild. I wish things could be different. Say, Marshall, how about taking me down to the dining car for some supper? It's still a long way from Leavenworth, and I'm getting kind of hungry. Duty calls. I can't deny a petition for food. It's the only friend of the unfortunate, and I'm a bit hungry myself. Well, goodbye, Miss Fairchild. Goodbye. <laughs> Say, that Marshall's a good sort of a chap. Some of these Western fellows are all right. Yes. Mr. Easton seems pretty young to hold an office like that, don't you think? Easton? Why, my dear, didn't you catch on to that little scene? Scene? Well, surely you noticed what was going on. What do you mean? Well, I feel sorry for you, dear. But surely you know as well as I that an officer of the law never handcuffs a prisoner to his right hand. <laughs> I love stepping into my stories, and trains are a fun place to meet people, but I also like the South. Um, personally, I like the Ural Mountains, but there are other places too, but I like crime too. I wrote a lot of stuff about crime, and so let me find, oh, here's, this is one of my absolute favorites. I never actually lived in the South, but the characters there always intrigued me. Would you humor me enough to let me take part in this story? It will just take a second. Let me tell you what happened a short time ago on a warm day in early summer. The Cumberland Mountains rose up blue-gray in the late afternoon haze, and all was quiet in our little settlement here in Piedmont County. Until Ramsey Bilbro and his young wife, Ariella, suddenly burst into the office of the Justice of the Peace, Benadja Widow. We all want a divorce. That's right, a divorce. We all can't get along no how. It's hard enough when a man and a woman cares for one another, but when she's always spitting like a wildcat and a moaning like a good owl, a man ain't got no call to live with her. When he's a no conformant, always keeping company with scalabags and moonshiners, and is crawling on his back and got the corn whiskey, a woman ain't got no call to live with him. When she's slinging pot lids and boiling water on the best coon dogs in the Cumberlands <laughs> and keeping a man awake at nights, accusing him of all sorts of misdeeds. It's always the fight and the revenue and gets a bad name in the mountain for being a mean man. A woman ain't got no call to sleep at nights. But settle down. <clears throat> According to equity and the Constitution and the golden rule, if a justice of the peace can marry a couple, it's plain that he can divorce him too, but the fee for that will be, in this case, five dollars. Well, I sold a bear skin and two foxes for five dollars. It's all the money we got. Benadja would have stuffed that five dollar bill into her pocket with the most deceptive air of indifference and wrote out the decree of divorce on a sheet of paper. When she had finished, she read it out loud to the Ramsey Bilbro and his wife, Ariella. <coughs> Know all men that Ramsey Bilbro and his wife, Ariella Bilbro, this day personally appeared before me and promised that hereafter they will neither love, honor, nor obey each other, neither for better nor for worse, being of sound mind and body, herein fail not, so help you God. Signed, Benadja Widger, Justice of the Peace from this county of Piedmont, State of Tennessee. Hold on, Judge. Don't you give him that paper yet? And Tate, I'll send him no how. I got to have my alley money first. Alley money? That's right, alley money. If Randy can afford a divorce, he can afford to pay me alley money. I ain't got no more money. I done paid you all I had. I'd be going up to Brother Ed's in Hogbark Mountain, and I'm going to need some shoes and other things besides. If Brandy can afford a divorce, again I say, he can afford to give me alley money. This point demands judicial decision. Brandy, your ex-wife's feet are bare, and the road up to Hogbath Mountain is steep and flimsy.
plenty. <clears throat> Ariella, how much do you suppose a good pair of shoes would cost? Well, for the shoes and all, five dollars. And that ain't much for Ellie money, but it'll have to do. Well, that seems like just the right amount. Well, I, like I said, I ain't got no more money. I done paid you all I had. Then you be in contempt of court. Well, I suppose if it gives me till tomorrow, I can scrape it up somewhere. I never had no idea you'd be wanting any alimony. money. <laughs> well, case adjourned until tomorrow, when we both of you will present yourselves and obey the order of this court, following which the decree of divorce will be offered. Ramsey and Ariella headed off to Uncle Deeds to spend the night. When it began to get dark, Justice of the Peace, the Nazi started home for supper in her double log cabin up the slope. As Benaja crossed the little creek in the middle of the laurel thicket, a dark figure of a man jumped in front of her and pointed a rifle at her heart. Hold up. I want your money. Hand it over. I'm getting nervous. And my fingers is wobbling on this here trigger. <laughs> all, all I got is this five, five dollars. <laughs> Roll it up. Stick it into the end of this here gun barrel. Now, I reckon you can be getting along, but don't look back. <laughs> the next day, when Randy Bilbro and his wife Ariella to return to Benaja's office, it was a nightmare. Randy Bilbro handed to Ariella the five dollar bill. Benaja viewed it sharply. It seemed to curl as though it had been stuck in the end of a gun barrel, but she refrained from comment. It was logical that other five dollar bills might be fine to curl. He, she then handed over the decree of divorce, but Ramsey and Ariella stood awkwardly silent. He slowly folding the guarantee of freedom. She slowly folding the five dollar bill. Well, Ramsey, I reckon you'll be going back up to the cabin? I reckon I will. There's bread in the tin box, and I put the bacon in the boiler pot to keep the hounds from getting it. And don't forget to wind the clock tonight. You going up to Brother Ed's now? I am. I ain't saying he'll want me, but... I ain't got nowhere else to go. Well, I guess this is goodbye. It's gonna be kind of lonesome in that old cabin up there, Randy. Well, sure it'll be lonesome, but when folks get mad and wants a divorce, you can't make folks stay. Nobody don't want nobody to stay. Nobody never said they did. Well, nobody never said they didn't. Well, Randy, I reckon we'll still be here. Wait, Ariella, nobody can wind that old clock like you. Do you want me to go back and wind it for you? I do, and then how shan't pester you no more. And I reckon I've been kind of mean and low down, but I won't be no more. Will you wind the clock for me tonight? I will. My heart's in that cabin, Randy, along with you. Let's start now so we can get home by sundown. Hold it! <clears throat> in the name of the state of Tennessee, I forbid y'all to be defying the law and statutes. The court is happy to see the clouds of discontent have gone away. But the court reminds you that you are no longer man and wife. <clears throat> However, the court is prepared to remove the disabilities and prepare the solemn ceremony of marriage. Thus, fixing things up, the fee for performing this ceremony will be five dollars. <laughs> and so, Ramsey and Ariella Bilbro were reunited in marriage and set off for their cabin in the mountains. Justice of the Peace, Benaja Witta, fingered that five dollar bill, and life went on, like a whirly gig. <laughs> well that's fun. Like I said before, I love the South, and I'm also interested in large cities. I like people and places, and certain people like the rich folk, and doing their things. I like to observe what they do, so let me find a good one. Oh, this one's a real gem. Oh, wait, no. Oh, here we go. This one was quite a masterpiece. You have to understand, I had a fascination not only with people, but people and places. People and places like the bustling metropolis of New York City in the early 1900s. This particular story involves the upper society. 
Well, at least they like to think so. This dear Hotel Lotus is an oasis in the July desert of Manhattan. The temperature here is perpetually April, and the distant roar of Broadway is similar to a distant waterfall, pleasant and restful. I quite agree, Miss Beaumont, and you, our guests, at the Hotel Lotus of Doors. The Bellboys, they have quite for the honor of answering your ring, and you possess the fine air of the elite, and your gown is exquisite. You are too kind. I can only say in return that you have drifted into the calm and exclusive circles of society here. No one has noticed a ripple. There is no doubt that you belong here. I feel quite at home here. What tires of the old resorts? Why fly to the seashore, to the mountains, when the very people that cause the dust and heat follow you there? Even on the ocean, the commoners are everywhere around you. The most exclusive steamers are becoming scarcely more than ferry boats. Oh, heaven help us, when the summer resorter discovers our dear hotel lotus. Our secret has been safe for this week. There is only one other resort I know of that is as exclusive and calm in the summertime, and that is the castle of the Count Polinsky in the Ural Mountains. I hear that Bad and Bad and Cannes are almost deserted this season. <coughs> year by year, the most exclusive resorts are falling into disrepute. Perhaps many others, like ourselves, are seeking out the quiet nooks that are overlooked by the majority. I promise myself just one more day of this delicious rest. Tomorrow my ship sails. I shall miss you too, for I too must leave tomorrow. Miss Farrington, I have a confession to make. Yes? I'll be leaving here in the morning because because I gotta go to work. Work? Yeah, I'm behind the hosiery counter at Casey's store. <laughs> My vacation is up tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. This dollar is the last money I see, I'll see until I draw my salary on Saturday. You've been a kind friend, and I wanted to tell you before I left. Surely you jest. No, I've always wanted to do this, to spend one week like a lady. Sleep late and ring bells for things, just like rich folks do. Now I've done it, and I'm the happiest I've ever been. I'll go back to work, satisfied for another year. I don't know what to say. And my name isn't Helen Miss Beaumont. It's Mamie Savitter. And this dress, it's the only thing decent enough I own to wear. I bought it on an installment plan at O'Dowd and Levinsky's. This dollar will pay the last installment due tomorrow. You are very brave to tell me this. Don't worry. I'll give you a receipt. A receipt? Yeah, I gotta go back to work in the morning, too. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm a bookkeeper at the office at O'Dowd and Levinsky's. Funny, isn't it? They both had the same idea about spending our vacation here. I've always wanted to put up at a swell hotel, and I saved up all my salary and did it. Say, how we go to Coney Island next Saturday afternoon, taking the sights? Who knows? We might find a couple of fellows with nothing to do. You bet. I get out at 12 o'clock on Saturday, and I've got nothing better to do. I guess the Coney will have to do, even if we did spend a wonderful week at the Hotel Lotus. Yeah. By the way, Mimi, my real name is Jenny McManus. It's nice to meet you, Jenny. Here's to tomorrow and Coney Island. To tomorrow and Coney Island. <laughs> New York was filled with uh, crime, and I do like crime. I know that's probably not a good thing, but I'm just interested in the way criminals are, and you know, nowadays criminal crime is a lot worse, but. In the 1900s, crime wasn't as criminal as it was for you folks today. The criminal that doesn't look so, look so criminally by the end of the story, especially when you realize that some things makes the whole world king. I have come to the conclusion that there are three types of burglars. I have come to this conclusion because robbers have tried to rob my uncle's house many times. And when the police catch them and take them away, I take note of their appearance. Their classification is simple. 
The collar is a distinguishing mark. If a burglar is caught who does not wear a collar, he is called a degenerate of his type, vicious and depraved. The second type of burglar is a burglar who wears a collar. This type of burglar is invariably a gentleman by day, while at night he plies his nefarious occupation. The third type of burglar is the most recent and most interesting type. He entered through my uncle's house through an open window that had been left unlocked. As he came in, he began to prowl. He wore no dark mask and carried no lantern and wore a green sweater. And while he prowled, he thoughtfully chewed peppermint gum. Three poker chips? No. A lot of money. Pink silk hair bow? Nice touch. Hold it! Say, stick out that left arm of yours! Hold, get it up! Get it up! No one knows if you might be ambitious enough to try and shoot with that one. Get him up! I, I can't! Why not? Rheumatism. It's in the shoulder. Oh, inflammatory? It was.
Money does make the world go round, and therefore the one who controls it controls the world. She sat with a wad of cash at her desk, reaping through her ledger. All of a sudden, Rosie came out to hand Antonia her ink. Here you are, ma'am. Thank you, Rosie. Hi, my name is Rosie Kelly, and I'm the housekeeper for Mrs. Antonia Rockwell, widow of old Mr. Rockwell, who is a proprietor for Rockwell's Eureka Soap Company, from which he made a vast fortune. Mrs. Rockwell's sister, Miss Ellen, who's also much impressed by wealth, lives here too. Now, Miss Ellen is a very kind and sentimental lady, but Mrs. Rockwell, she has a temper that may be described as a thin. But their hearts are of one accord when it comes to their young nephew and son, Mr. Richard Rockwell. One evening, not so long ago, Mrs. Rockwell called Richard into their parlor. Richard? Richard? Oh, I just can't resist. Aunt Ellen? You want her to see me, Mother? My boy, you are a gentleman. You have as much money as any young man can wish to waste, and yet you stick to what is decent and moderate. Your late father made a fortune in soap, but you do little or nothing with that fortune. Mother, there are some things that money just can't buy. What? <laughs> Tell me one thing that money won't buy. For one thing, it won't buy me into the exclusive circles of society. Oh, it won't. You tell me where your exclusive circles of society would be if the first aster hadn't made enough money to passage his steerage over to America. I've noticed something wrong with you, son, for about two weeks now. If you need it, I could lay my hands on 11 million within 24 hours. Or, if it's a physical ailment, there's a ship bound for the Bahamas in two days. Those are not bad guesses, Mother, but you're missing the mark. Ah, I see. What's her name? Why don't you ask her the big question? You've got lots of money, good looks, and you're a decent boy. You've been to college, but I'm sure she'll overlook that. I haven't had a chance to ask her. Then make one. Take her out for a walk in the park or on a long carriage ride. You don't know her social mill. Every minute of her time is planned for days and days in advance. But I must have her. I'm crazy in love with her, and I don't know what I'll do, what I'll do if I can't have her. Do you mean to tell me, with all the money I've got, you can't get an hour or two of this girl's time for yourself? I've put it off too late. Miss Lantry sails for Europe noon the day after tomorrow. I'm to see her in a cab to escort her to Wallach's Theater. Her mother and a large party of her friends will be there waiting for us. Do you think she would want to hear a declaration from me under those six or eight minutes? No. And what chance would I have in the theater or afterwards? I'm afraid this is one tangle your money can't unravel. We can't buy time with money. If we could, then rich people would live longer. There's no hope of getting to see Miss Landry before she sails. We'll see. Run along to a club, son. Poor boy. I wish there was something we could do. Maybe you can't order eternity wrapped up and delivered at your residence, but I've seen Father Time get some pretty bad bruises when he walks through the gold diggings. I wish you wouldn't think about money so much, sister. Wealth is nothing where true affection is concerned. If only Richard had spoken to Miss Landry sooner, she could not have refused him. But now, I fear it is too late. Richard will have no opportunity to speak to her, and all of your gold cannot bring any happiness to your son. Hmm, what's that you said, Ellen? Gold cannot bring happiness? Huh, perhaps, perhaps. It remains to be seen. Well, I have an idea of my own to help my nephew in this dilemma. At 8.30 the next evening, Miss Ellen took a quaint old gold ring and gave it to Richard. I would like you to wear this ring tonight, Richard. My mother, your grandmother, gave it to me and told me that it brought one good luck in love. She asked me to give it to you when you found the one you loved. Oh, 
Thanks, Aunt Ellen. I can't wear it, but I'll keep it in my pocket. It's kind of you to think of me, but I don't have much hope of finding any use for this ring. I've got to run now. Miss Lantry expects for me to have the cab for her soon. Well, my brother Tim, he is a gardener for the Rockwell family, and I could testify to have him that evening. And it was one of the most remarkable things I ever saw. Young Mr. Richard called for Miss Lantry in the cab at 8.30 and headed for Walk Cedar. They whirl up 42nd Street to Broadway, but at 34th Street, Richard suddenly ordered the cabman to stop. Stop! I've dropped a ring. It was my grandmother's. I saw where it fell. It'll only take a moment. Richard stepped out of the cab and was back inside in a minute. But during that minute, you won't believe what happened. A crosstown streaker stopped directly in front of the cab. The cabman tried to pass on the left, but a big express wagon cut him off. He tried the right side, but he had to back away from a furniture van. The cab was blockaded in a tangled mess of vehicles and horses, as is known, from time to time to tie things up quite suddenly in the big city. <laughs> tell the drive, tell the cabman to drive on, Richard. It will be late. But the space of Broadway, 6th Avenue, and 34th Street crossed was tied up as tight as a 26-inch maiden throws her 22-inch girdle. <laughs> all the traffic in Manhattan, all the traffic in Manhattan seemed to have jammed itself around that cab. And still from all the cross streets came all the drivers locking wheels and adding their driver's curses to their clamor. The oldest New Yorker among the thousands of spectators that lined the streets hadn't seen a blockade of the proportions of this one. I'm sorry, it looks as if they're, we're stuck. They won't get this jumble loosened up for about an hour. It's my fault if I hadn't dropped the ring. That's all right. I really don't care whether we go to the theater or not. May I see the ring? It was my grandmother's. I've been told that that it brings good luck and love. It's beautiful, Richard. Would you like to try it on? Yes. Antonia, isn't it wonderful? Our Richard and Miss Landry are engaged. Don't ever boast of the power of love to me again. All it took was a little ring, a dear emblem of true love, that symbolized unending and unmercenary affection was the cause of Richard finding his true happiness. What's this about a ring? Richard told me all about it. On the way to the theater, he dropped the ring in the street. When he went to retrieve it, a blockade surrounded them, and they couldn't get out for two hours. Two hours! Richard spoke to Miss Landry of his undying love and won her heart forever. Well, I'm glad Richard has the girl he wanted. I told him I would spare no expense to- Oh, hush, 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 dear Antonia. Money is dross where true affection is concerned. Miss Ellen's upstairs, ma'am. And here's my darling brother, Tim. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, Tim. Well, it's about time to uh, settle up with you and Rosie. Let's see, I gave you $5,000 in cash to start. Yes, ma'am, and I passed it right along to Tim. I did have $300 more of my own. I had to go a little above the estimate. I got the cash in the best bag and he wants it for $5. But the truck was really amazing, it's 10 The more than one at $10, it's only the road between 20 The cops struck me the hardest. $50 to start with. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm sorry to have to ask you to pay for the cab, but I have to go. Tim and I watched all from a six-story window. There was no time for a rehearsal, but the driver was all on time, just a fraction of a second. I never saw nothing like it before my life now. Well, here you are. One, two, three, four, five. <coughs> One, two, three, four, five. Five hundred each, plus the three hundred you were out on cash. Now, you two, Oh, no, don't despise money, do you? Oh, no, ma'am. Tim and me can lick the men who invite the poverty. That we can, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I really wish I could have been there to see it all happen. By the way, you two didn't happen to notice somewhere in the blockade a little chubby boy flying around with no clothes on and shooting bow a bow with arrows, did you? A little chubby boy flying about. No clothes on. Shooting arrows? Gracious. Maybe the cops pinched him. No, he does nothing <laughs> like that, ma'am. 
I didn't think you would. I was pretty sure that that little rascal wouldn't be on hand. Thank you all for coming and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and I hope you also enjoyed the production of O. Henry and his small stories put on by the BCS drama students. Thanks for coming.